Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is Caroline Griffin. I'm Riot's Director of Operations. You have found the Riot Lunch and Learn series, the place where we feature all of Riot's partners. And I'm super excited to have Karen Lindquist here with us today of Greenstream. Karen has been a longtime supporter of Riot. Um, she and Jim of Greenstream actually um, have their office at the Wireless Research Center, which is Riot's um, parent company. So lots of close ties there. But Karen is here with us today to share about fun with flood data. Before we get started, just a couple of quick reminders. Um, you will be able to use the chat box if you'd like to ask questions, but also Karen has agreed to an interactive session. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, I encourage you to unmute yourself and ask. But of course, if you feel more comfortable, you can use the chat box. This will be recorded and posted to Riot's YouTube channel and the meetup where you signed up for the event. Um, and those are all the reminders I have for you all. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Karen. Uh, we appreciate you being with us today. Well, thank you, Caroline. Thank you for your gracious introduction. And hello to everybody. It's Jim, Joe, Roger, Ron, Russell, Brian. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you are as excited about uh, flooding and flood data and environmental data as I am. We are going to kick it off. Just wanted to let you know I am Karen Lindquist. I am the co founder of Greenstream Technologies. Uh, my partner, Jim Gray, is the CEO. I am the COO. Uh, but in reality, he's also the CTO. He has uh, um, he has invented our entire system. He's uh, all of the flood data that we generate is thanks to Jim and I run the business side of it. So our presentation today is going to be a little bit less on the technical side in terms of uh, manipulating data sets and more on the what is the value of the data that we produce? How are our customers using the data to make their lives better? All right. So Greenstream Technologies, um, the easiest way to remember what we do is Greenstream advises when the water rises. We are doing real time environmental monitoring and you know, specifically focusing on flood monitoring. Uh, I think one of the nice things about what we are doing for our customers is that we're making it easier and more affordable for them to deploy sensors out in the environment and collect the information, get it in real time. When the sensors are more affordable and when you're getting the data in an affordable way, that means you can afford to collect more data at more points, you get more detailed data, and then you've got a more interesting data set to work with rather than having one you know, big expensive sensor deployed in one location and trying to figure out what the situation is on the ground from there. All right. So we started our company in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, we are today we're in Wake Forest, but we started in Norfolk, Virginia, where we lived. And the reason why we started the company was because we saw um, all of this constant flooding around us, nuisance flooding, uh, more serious stormwater flooding. And we kept seeing people uh, driving into the flood water, losing their cars, putting themselves into danger. And we realized that we were, you know, we were messing around with IoT and with sensors and things. And we said, we could do something about this. And so we started with our own city with a little proof of concept project, uh, putting sensors up, you know, directly over the roads, actually, in the intersections. And from there, it grew. Uh, we won an innovation prize by MIT Solve early on for coastal communities. And we got accepted into the RIOT program. And that's actually what brought us down to North Carolina. We were quite interested and attracted to being part of the Research Triangle community down here and uh, reached out to the folks at RIOT. And that was the beginning of, that was the catalyst. So anyway, let me come back to this. The value that we aim to produce with our flood data is to help mainly city authorities, but not only, to better protect property. So that's um, buildings and installations and homeowners property 
but also to improve safety, uh, specifically, you know, with regard to citizens and motorists and, you know, people doing deliveries and an area that's flooding, and also to improve mobility so commerce doesn't slow down, so you can reroute traffic so that um, people are not being directed by their GPS applications uh, into flood water, as has happened before. Okay, so we are growing our flood monitoring network. Um, we are up to about 112 devices in the field. You can see our map there. We are mostly in Virginia and North Carolina, um, spreading out from the coast. And we also have our first international deployment there in Guyana in Latin America. Um, fun fact, this is the only English speaking country in Latin America, uh, British Guyana. Um, talk more about that later. Uh, here's a list of some of our customers and some of the organizations that have supported us. Certainly Riot. Um, thank you, Caroline. <laughs> and um, yeah, since we've gotten here, we have won an NC IDEA grant and a couple of local awards. We're very grateful for that. And most recently, we have been accepted onto a program by the First Flight Venture Center for um, getting federal funding. All right, what are we offering? We are offering a typical IoT full stack end-to-end -end solution. So um, you know how it works. You've seen this before. A, um, a network of environmental sensors out there, the denser the network, uh, the more detailed data you have. We use wireless communications to send the data in real time to our cloud platform. And then we push that data in real time out to um, an online dashboard that is viewable from you know, PC or from a uh, telephone. And uh, we also send APIs so that customers can get the information onto their, uh, into their own platforms as well. And this is what those edge sensors look like. Um, we use a variety of third party sensor devices, but what we do is we are making the transceiver, um, the uh, transmitter plus receiver. Uh, it provides two way communications, but it also provides power to the sensors so that everything truly is light, low footprint, um, uh, very easy installation, no cables to lay, um, no Wi-Fi networks to have to set up. Everything communicates in real time. And by the way, these things can report um, some versions, battery operated only some with the support of the solar panel you see here in the picture. Um, they can report 10 times an hour, that's every six minutes, uh, 24 seven, and that battery is gonna last about three years at that reporting rate. We have two wireless communications op options that we offer to our customers, both LTE and LoRaWAN. I'll talk more about that later, but uh, this is for both urban deployments and also, um, I guess, you would say suburban, but also the rural and remote deployments as well as sometimes LoRaWAN is increasingly an interesting alternative to LTE. And finally, the data goes into our real-time online dashboard. This is what it looks like. This is the environmental data that we are producing. So um, in the case of the water level sensors, I'll back up here, we also have rain gauges that work on our system. But in the case of water level sensors, you can see the water level um, constantly changing in real time. You can check the actual um, level here. We also monitor air temperature as well. And then the other data that our customers get on their dashboards is the device health. So making sure that you know the, the battery has enough power there, you can see it you know, sort of uh, runs down during the day and it um, runs down overnight and then the sun comes up and it powers up in the morning, um, full speed all day and then it starts to, to go down again. And as well as the signal strength in the area, um, is the sensor picking up signal strength and are we able to get the data out in real time? So great, good, that's what we do. 
cool that we can produce this data, but what do I do with all this data? And here I'm going to ask you, and you can go ahead and type your answers in the chat, or if you'd like to unmute and share what some of your thoughts might be. If you were a city, let's say, um, and you had flood problems in the city, and you had a network of sensors monitoring rainfall and flooding, and if you could get the info in real time, how would you use it? What do you think? Alerts. Okay. Alerts to who, Mariela? Alert the citizens. Yes, you could alert citizens so that they would know to stay out of flood water. So we do get, in many cities, we do get generalized alerts, like there may be flooding in your area over the next two to four hours, right? But this time you could get uh, specific alerts about places that may be near your home or on your commute. Send it out to first responders. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. First responders are very interested in this kind of data. And we'll talk more about how they're using it as well. What else do you think? Patterns and trends over time. Thank you, Sudhakar. Yes. So you're collecting the real time data and you're consuming it in real time, but you can also look back and you can see what is happening over time. So let's dig into some of the ways that our customers are using that. Some of them will be um, aspirational, <laughs> like works in progress, but not quite done yet. And some of them are actually up and running. So yes, um, our customers are interested in consuming the data in real time so that instead of reacting, they can actually uh, respond to emergencies. Oh, watershed monitoring. Thank you, Roger. Good. Um, and we'll talk about that as well. The other thing that you can do is once you start getting these real-time warnings and once you start detecting patterns and once you start maybe sharing data downstream, we can start talking about advanced warnings as well too. Or you can see maybe the water level starting to rise before it overtops the road and you can uh, get people out of harm's way in advance of when the situation actually starts to become dangerous. Uh, another way that customers use the data is for decision support. Um, we'll talk more about that later as well, too. But, you know, bigger decisions like, you know, where should we do our mitigation projects? Um, where should we invest in making improvements in the road, for example? And then finally, of course, for prediction and predictive models. There are lots of predictive models out there that are being worked on by a variety of not-for-profits, um, collaborations between government and academic agencies. And one thing that they all have in common is that they lack the detailed data to make sure that their predictions are, um, are really accurate. And we'll be talking about that as well. All right. So one of the, I guess, most uh, pressing uses of the real-time data, we were talking about that, is um, uh, certainly emergency operations sensors. Uh, centers. We'll start with real-time. Um, agencies like Public Works, the Stormwater Division, the street supervisor division in a city, the fire department and emergency management, but also park managers and dam managers. Um, when we are talking to them, they are frustrated because they're typically either reacting to a 911 call to, you know, to go out and close something down or reacting to a 311 call. Uh, or sometimes they are sending vehicles out on patrol during storms uh, to check on things. It is not fun to go out in the middle of the night <laughs> to check on a dam uh, to see if it's starting to overflow. So they're all interested in getting the information in real time, not just for one location, but for all the places that flood in their cities. And here is one of the examples that we have right here. Uh, this is 
This is Boone, North Carolina. I'm sorry that picture is just grabbed off the internet, but this is a mountain community uh, in Western North Carolina. It is crisscrossed by a dense network of creeks that feed into the New River. And the creeks are pretty harmless most of the time until there's a big rain event, whether that rain event is in Boone or whether it's further uh, upland, but then the water starts rushing through Boone, okay? And the fire chief, show you a picture of him right here. That's him in the foreground there, Jimmy Isaacs. He says, you know, I wanna know where it's happening and when it's happening so I can keep people out of the water. He's got um, a team of swift water rescue experts that train constantly in swift water rescue like the guy you see in the picture here. But he said, it's just like you know going into a fire. It's dangerous for people to get caught in flood water. We don't want them to, but we also would rather not have to get in the water to pull them out if we could prevent these incidents. So he decided to um, install his first little um, project of you know, five sensors in the city. And that's my partner, Jim Gray, in the background. Uh, that's on installation day. And less than a week after we installed it, this is what happened to that bridge that we were standing on. It was inundated by water. And this happens all the time. And he said, like, we don't even know until you know, somebody calls it in or somebody stuck. Um, but this time he was able to sit back in his office, it's raining, he looks at the data and he sees, whoop, I'm hitting my minor threshold, he goes out, he closes the road, he takes a bunch of beautiful pictures for us, and uh, this is what that flood curve looked like. So that was about a almost five foot rise in the water level, this is a rather low bridge, in a very, very short amount of time, and then of course it disappears in a short amount of time as well. Um, you know, there are federal, the USGS keeps track of water levels as well, but they miss, they always miss the flash flooding because it happens too quickly for them. And then they report it after the fact. So it's, it can be helpful for, you know, monitoring patterns, but it's not so helpful in real time. But here we get it in real time. Here's another example of a real-time flood event. This is further uh, west in Wilson, North Carolina. Wilson is in the, the plains of North Carolina. And um, the way they put it to us when we first went out to talk to them about their flooding issues is they said, this whole region is a bowl and Wilson sits on the bottom of the bowl. So whenever it is flooding anywhere else, it's 10 times worse in Wilson. So here is a teeny tiny sleepy little creek and that bridge that you see is about uh, 10 feet above the, the creek level, but this is a day wherein it rained last summer, June, June 26, I believe, and that water just <laughs> level just shot up uh, nine feet in just a few hours. And then again, uh, came down again later. So for them, that was very exciting to see it. First of all, to know it's happening, to know they need to close the road, but then also to have actual data on how deep it got and how long it took to get that deep. All right. The other thing that we do uh, that I've been talking about is um, uh, we produce APIs so that our customers who want to can pull the data into their existing systems or into systems that they're building. And a really good example of that is the town of Cary in uh, right here in the research triangle. Cary is one of the smart city poster child, uh, smart city stars, I guess, um, in the United States right now. Um, they are very innovative. They try a lot of projects. And this is what we got pulled into with Carrie. Um, there's Jim again on the left. We, are, um, we deployed about 10 sensors in the city and um, we worked for about three days with them. This was a collaboration of, um, let's see, we got our sensor data reporting through Microsoft Azure IoT Hub to Dell Boomi, out to Salesforce to generate work orders for the city, for example, to close off streets when it's flooding. And um, the, their internal dashboard was built by SAS. 
SAS is the, um, the data analytics company, and SAS is right now building them a predictive model using the rain and the creek level data that we're producing. This was the first collaboration in the joint venture between Microsoft and SAS that was announced last summer. And um, the whole project won a Research Triangle Clean Tech Award in the water category. So we're quite proud of that. That was a rather extensive integration, but we do that with our customers. All right, here's another interesting community that makes really good use of flood data. All those points that you see on the map are where we have sensors uh, up in Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach is just above, uh, it shares a border with um, Currituck County in North Carolina. Uh, and obviously <laughs> it's a coastal region. Let me ask you, what do you think might be some of the causes of flooding in a coastal community like Virginia Beach? And you know, you could say the same of Wilmington, North Carolina, for example, or New Bern. What do you think might be some of the causes of flooding? Hurricanes, yeah. And what is it about the hurricanes that cause the flooding? What do you think is the action on the water there, Wendy? Storm surge. Storm surge is one of them. That's one of the first ones we think of for the coast. And there are lots of models that predict storm surge. But that's not the only cause of flooding in the coast. What are some other ones? Has anybody seen some of the sunny day flooding? Poor drainage, that certainly also contributes to flooding. Yes, um, the land is so flat and the sea level is rising and the water just has nowhere to go. In fact, some of these communities don't even have storm drains. Virginia Beach is well drained, but still <laughs> they do have problems with drainage. So there are a few factors, you know, one of course will be storm surge from hurricanes, uh, but also the tides. Sunny day flooding, you can have very high tides. Has anybody heard of a king tide where, you know, certain times of the year, the moon's pull on the water pulls very high tides and with sea level, that combined with sea level rise means that now you're getting flooded streets for no reason other than just high tide. And that water, it doesn't come like from the sea and up onto land, but it'll come up through the storm drains and into the sea and start, uh, um, start to contribute to flooding. So Jim, you said you're interested that tide-induced flooding is occurring. Yes, all up and down our coasts. Um, every, every coastal town is dealing with this tide flooding. It especially happens around September, October, and November of the year. Those are called the spring tides because the water springs forward, uh, even though they occur in the fall. Um, so yeah, tide can uh, lead to flooding, but also rainfall. You know, the heavy rainstorms that we get inland, they get those on the coast as well too. So in a hurricane, it's not only the storm surge that you have to worry about, but it's also the rainfall. And there's another factor that contributes to flooding. That can be uh, the wind. So imagine you see this piece of water down here, Back Bay. Um, Back Bay is connected to the Currituck Sound, is connected down to the Albemarle Sound, is connected all the way down to the Pamlico Sound in North Carolina. Um, when you get water, uh, sorry, not water, when you get a southerly wind, that is uh, blowing on that water. It pushes all the water north. It pushes all the water back upstream. And um, what happens is that water collides with the water that is coming from the, the creeks feeding into, um, feeding into these bays. And it pushes the water back up the creeks and it floods back up into the neighborhoods. Even a lake, something like, uh, this lake here where we have a couple of sensors. Uh, same thing, the wind, if you have a sustained wind pushing for a long enough time, it'll push water across a lake. And I know it looks like you know a flat level surface to us, but it'll be flooding on one side of that lake where the wind is pushing and the water level would be very low on the other side of the lake. So that happens regularly um, in areas with large bodies of water. 
The other thing that can happen when you are at the coast is that it floods inland and then that water, that big lump of water makes its way down the river back to you. So if you think about Hurricane Florence, when it hit North Carolina uh, a couple of years ago, um, first the coast got hit by flooding from its own, you know, the storm being over the coast, then the storm moved inland and it caused a lot of flooding inland. And then the coast got hit again when all that um, extra rain that fell inland made its way back out to the coast. And finally, what can happen on the coast is a combination of all of those factors and they can really exacerbate each other. So um, obviously coastal communities are extremely interested in collecting data and in studying what's going on and in studying the combination of factors. So here's what Virginia Beach will do, for example. Um, there is, I'll show you again on the map, there's this long strip of land here called Sandbridge. It's kind of like Virginia's Outer Banks. Um, there's only one road going into Sandbridge and one road going out of Sandbridge, and it's a pretty thin strip of land. And when it floods, they are just stuck there. They're stranded until the water goes down again. Um, so high water on the roads uh, can close the road. So this was last April. Um, this was, it was rain. Here's the aftermath here. This is what Sandbridge Road looked like. Had to close down the roads and they used to react, but now they use the data to help them know to close the roads ahead of time. This is a low-lying neighborhood in Virginia Beach with a series of retaining ponds. So you can have these inland, but you can also have them on the coast. And so what would happen was the retaining ponds would fill up when it would rain and this whole neighborhood would flood. And this is what it looks like when it floods. Uh, that neighborhood doesn't flood much anymore because we've got sensors in those retaining ponds now and the city knows when the water level gets to a certain height, they just, turn on the uh, drainage pumps and pump the water out. They have a lot, they see a lot less of this nowadays. So we've got a few uh, requests also from coastal towns in North Carolina, which we hope to close the sale on those to monitor their retaining ponds as well. Uh, this is one that we aren't doing yet, but the, the um, city of Raleigh is doing regularly. They've got, uh, at some of the low points, they've got these um, warning signs posted everywhere. So when um, the water starts rising, these signs will automatically turn on and start flashing and tell people not to go into the flood water. Um, these signs have a pressure sensor at the bottom of them, but we can really, you know, I know the manufacturer of the sign, we can connect them to any kind of um, flood sensor and uh, to activate signs like this. So I think that uh, that's a really great opportunity for a community would be to automate that type of warning sign, maybe to automate um, railroad style barrier gates that close down so that um, you know, instead of having, trying to put up cones on a road and having people drive around them. That's a fun use of flood data. Another one that we would like to see is a, a couple of uh, cities have tried this, but nobody to my knowledge has gotten very far with it except the city of Norfolk. Um, early on, they had an experimental project where they had we're pushing our sensor data into the Ways Connected Communities program. Um, this is a program that it's a cooperation between cities and between Ways where they agree to share data. Um, I guess nobody makes any money off of it except for Ways, uh, but it's nice because the city can push its um, traffic related data into the Ways program so that it can improve mobility in the city. Um, nowadays, and I know this happened during Hurricane Florence, Waze sent a lot of people into flood water um, when everybody was trying to find out how they could evacuate the state. A lot of them got directed toward flood water. So I think it would be really cool to get more communities connected to ways to actually drive people out of flood water. And if any cities want to work on that, we would be very happy to work with you. All right, so that's real time. Um, how can you get advance warning? 
uh, we have a few ideas. You know, one obviously is that you would like to get some data for you know what's happening upstream. And this is the uh, town of Danville. Danville, you can see there on the map, it's on the River Dan. Um, we are in the process right now of putting sensors in for them. This is what happens in Danville when the River Dan is high. It floods like crazy. So they're putting the sensors in and it's good for them for real time data. But one of the things that they want to do is they want to share their data to their neighbors downstream, uh, South Boston in Virginia. It's, it's not Boston, it's a town called South Boston in Virginia. And they said, so when it's flooding here, you know, it's going to be flooding about 20 minutes later in South Boston, and we'd like to share with them. And I think sharing is caring. I think there is a great opportunity for uh, using this type of data, not to just protect your own community, but if you can get more regional sharing going and you can get regions cooperating with each other and everybody sees the same data, you can have a lot better emergency response and a lot more insightful um, predictions. All right, because here's the state of North Carolina, <laughs> the water is a really dense network of water. It starts in one jurisdiction. It flows into another jurisdiction. It does not care about city lines. And if you think about um, the, well, I'll come back to that one. Luckily, and I don't know how many of you know this, um, but uh, North Carolina, the state, has a flood warning system, a statewide flood warning system, and it's pretty dense. I know it looks very dense on the map. Um, it's not dense enough, so we're looking for ways to get more sensors into this system. Um, you know, some of the older sensors are extremely um, expensive, so it's hard to get enough funding to afford more of them. But nowadays, um, sensors like ours are coming online. Quite a few of the sensors, especially in Eastern North Carolina that you see in this system, they're ours. Um, they were paid for by the state, they were installed by the state, but not only. Before I move on, I would like to share with you the, um, I wanna share with you the website of this system. It's called Feynman. What you can do is you can go there and you can zoom in and find the sensor that is nearest to where you live or to where you work or where somebody that, you know, one of your loved ones lives uh, or maybe along your commute. And you can actually subscribe to that sensor. And when the water level is high or if it's predicted to get high there, um, they will send you a text and so that you know. And then when it goes back to normal, they'll send you a text to let you know it's back to normal. Um, that's early primitive. Hopefully we would like to do things that are much more sophisticated than that. But okay, so good. So um, the state of North Carolina, this is uh, the Department of Emergency Management. They are working with um, emerging technologies like ours to be able to monitor more spots um, more cheaply and provide more data to citizens. Um, so one of the things is since the state is our customer but also municipalities and counties are our customers, um, we realized that if the municipalities are monitoring this stuff anyway and the municipalities are also looking at Feynman, wouldn't it be a good idea to, for the municipalities to share their sensor data onto Feynman? So we've enabled that for those municipalities that want to. Um, they share their data up to this, and a few of them are doing it already. And the town of Cary, together with Riot, because they're always innovative, they said, what if we could do a cool project for us to not only share up to the state, but what if we could set up a peer-to-peer -peer sharing project um, so that any community could share with any other community? So if you think of the town of Cary, they have two big creeks that flood in Cary. One is um, Crabtree Creek and the other one is Walnut Creek. But Crabtree Creek, 
first it floods in Cary, but then all that flooding flows downstream across the north of Raleigh and it causes flooding along, you know, at Crabtree Valley Mall. It causes flooding at Six Forks and Old Wake Forest Road. Um, so Raleigh wants, has an interest in knowing when it's flooding upstream in Cary. And then the same for South Raleigh. There are some uh, terrible flood spots in South Raleigh that are caused by Walnut Creek as well. Um, so what we did was we spent an entire year uh, working together. Uh, we started with a technical architecture that, you know, we Greenstream built so that it's a common protocol so that everybody could share um, environmental sensor data with each other, whether it's flood data or other types of sensor data. Um, so we came up with a technical architecture for that in a sort of a JSON format so that they could publish that as open data and anybody can consume anybody else's data. But we spent much longer building a project charter together, building a data rights agreement together and building a, um, and not just that, but it was an agreement. What is the agreement that we have for how we um, share with each other and how does it work? And we also created, um, because we were started with sharing our stormwater data, uh, we created a use case around that. And that is currently hosted, all of that documentation is hosted on the Triangle J Council of Governments website. So it's the collaboration of these, of these counties. And it won an IDC Smart City Award last year. And we'd like to see, you know, there's just like the first few little baby steps of sharing this data. We would like to see more of this going on. We're always happy to help enable it. Um, and also the opportunity is not just sharing stormwater data, but there is other types of data that crosses borders like traffic data or crime data or pollution data, air pollution and water pollution. All of those could be operating on the same framework. All right, so when we are sharing, we have uh, advanced warning. We also have real-time data, but think also about um, all the fun you can have using data to support decisions. And I pulled this down. This is from Colorado. This is um, you know, one of my favorite quotes is that disasters cost billions and mitigation projects so construction projects to, um, to mitigate flooding, those can cost in the millions. For just a few thousand, you can have a network of sensors that is um, helping you decide where to, uh, where to deploy your mitigation project. Um, you know, oftentimes what happens in communities is that a mitigation project gets built in one area because you have more vocal residents there, or you have a person who's very influential who's arguing for that area. Um, sensor data is just cold, hard data. Um, it tells you where the worst flooding is happening. And I think that combined with environmental studies on elevation uh, can give you a much clearer picture about where you could get the biggest bang for your buck if you uh, do a mitigation project somewhere. I think also sensor data is a really good way to um, measure a before and after. So, you know, before the project, whether it is a mitigation project or whether it's a development or a construction project, what are the water levels? Um, what's the level of runoff, for example, that's being produced into this creek? Um, and then after the intervention or after the construction, what is it now? So this is good for you know proving the validity of a, of a project and reporting on it. Um, yeah, it could also be a wetland uh, project as well too, building a wetland or restoring a wetland. And you know, um, and you know, what are the results afterward? That's good for um, proving the validity, but it's also good for monitoring, automating your monitoring for compliance purposes. All right, prediction. So um, 
obviously we are most active in coastal communities and um, there is a collaboration between University of North Carolina, LaSalle University, um, NOAA, National Weather Service, uh, a bunch of research agencies. It's called the Coastal Emergency Risks Assessment. So they really are monitoring trying to monitor all of the factors that contribute to coastal flooding. And they are suffering from the project that I, the problem that I talked about earlier, lack of data. So they've got lots of data about tides and currents and ocean levels and how they're affected. They've got lots of data about overland flow of water, uh, certainly in the mountains, because you can model that pretty easily. If you know the elevation, you know where the water is gonna be channeled. But what happens when the water hits the plains? That's hard to predict because now all of a sudden you've got more or less a flat surface and the water just sort of goes everywhere. And so, you know, there are predictive models and this, um, this Sarah, they call it, is one of them. But the best quote that I ever heard from an emergency manager was, yeah, there is your prediction. And then there's my reality <laughs> of what I have to deal with when it rains. And those are different things. So um, we've been talking to Currituck County, which is right here in Northeastern North Carolina, just under Virginia Beach right here. Um, they had nothing. For years, they had zero data. And they were trying to use this uh, risk assessment, coastal risk assessment, and it never, ever, ever lined up with what was actually happening on the ground. Uh, so the first thing is those red pins that you see there, the state put those in. So that was North Carolina Emergency Management and those got put onto Feynman. Um, but then the uh, county itself, Currituck County, found some funding and they've actually applied for further funding. So we've put in these green uh, sensors to sort of map the sound. What's cool about that now is that that information about where is it really flooding in Currituck County is getting shared up to, um, up to North Carolina Emergency Management, that Feynman system that we saw. And it is going to be picked up by SARA, by the National Weather Service, by FEMA, uh, and it will all be paid for with FEMA grant money which I think is really interesting. So FEMA has a program that, you know, every uh, coastal community is, um, is eligible to apply for. It's called, um, I think it's called hazard mitigation assistance, but it's under the rubric of what they call the BRIC grant. If you Google FEMA BRIC, that's building resilient, um, no, resilient something coast. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's really to help uh, communities to protect themselves, do mitigation programs or monitoring programs like we're doing to protect themselves from flooding. So we're really, really interested to see what happens with Currituck County now that they're getting this data in. They're already using it in real time. Um, we work directly with the assistant emergency coordinator and his job is already a lot easier because you can see what's going on and what's happening. Um, because I'll show you back again his territory. Imagine this guy, he's got, he and his team have got to cover um, a wildlife refuge. They've got this long peninsula of land. It is only connected through this one little connector down here. Um, so you've got beach community out here and here you've got rural farm community, but you've also got big developments coming in causing more flooding as well. So he somehow got to be covering what's happening on the bay, <laughs> what's happening at the beach and what's happening inland with all these rivers and creeks as well. And this is what it looks like inland. This is Moyoc, North Carolina. Um, and there's one of the sensors that he's put in to monitor, um, monitor one of the waterways out there so that now he can see when it's actually starting to happen. Okay. Oh, Joe, thank you. Um, last thing I wanted to talk about before we go is the promise of Laura Wan. 
um, as opposed to LTE. But certainly we're still working with LTE where you know, it's easy to deploy because you don't need any extra infrastructure. You can just hook into the cell networks, but cell networks don't always work during a storm. Sometimes they go down or sometimes they just aren't available in some areas, right? So um, this is a research uh, triangle. This is a uh, Cisco's headquarters, and Cisco is in the LoRaWAN business, among many other things. They're in the connector business, uh, but they do LoRaWAN connectors. And so they've got a little bit of flooding out on this lake here. Um, we've got one of our test sensors out there that lets them know when the water is going up and down, but it's also talking to their LoRaWAN gateway. That's the thing with LoRaWAN is that you need to have a gateway installed. Obviously, this is on the rise. It's, it's still an emerging technology. It's about seven years old now, um, but it's maturing and it's becoming more prevalent and it's becoming a better and better solution. So in the time that we've been using LoRaWAN, we've been able to greatly, greatly, greatly reduce the power consumption to the point where we've been able to eliminate the solar panel, which makes suddenly the devices a whole lot easier and smaller to work with. Um, our electronics have shrunk down a lot um, because of thanks to Laura Wan, and we're able to set up closed networks um, that you know the city has more control over. And also, setting up closed Laura Wan networks means that you can deploy remotely. All of your sensors, instead of having to talk to a cell network, can talk to the one gateway, and that gateway can talk to um, talk to the internet or talk to the cloud. I did also want to add that LoRa also stands for long range. So a device can be several miles away from its receptor as long as it has a, um, a good line of sight. So you can build a rather large network with a LoRaWAN gateway. And here is uh, one of our LoRaWAN poster children. This is again, uh, Wilson, North Carolina, the, the bowl at the bottom of the bowl. This is what it looks like when there's a lot of rain uh, running into Wilson. Uh, they have their own broadband network. They are the only town in North Carolina to have their own municipal broadband network. And they are quite distrustful of the cell companies, especially during storm disasters. So they're building their own LoRaWAN network. I mean, it's up and running. Uh, we've, we've supplied them with the gateways and we're helping them with the technology. And um, we're deploying our sensors all around. So what they want to find out is, um, is this the solution? Is this um, a communication that we can rely on for our emergency communications when cell networks go down? Stay tuned for how Wilson does with its LoRaWAN experiment. Other LoRaWAN customers, uh, this is, LoRaWAN is widely used in European cities. So they are much more mature than we are. They've already got a bunch of gateways up. And this is the coastal town of Aveiro in Portugal. And we are in a, um, in a proposal stage right now with them. Hope we win. <laughs> but what they want to do is they are called the Venice of Portugal because they have a lot of downtown canals. You can barely see it on the map right there. And these canals are connected to a big lagoon, something like Venice. And when the tide is too high or in the lagoon, when there's too much water or when there's too much wind pushing on the water, um, their canals flood and it floods everywhere downtown. So they've got, they've built a system of floodgates and they want to use sensors like ours, hopefully ours, to monitor the water levels uh, inside of the floodgates and outside of the floodgates. So they can close the floodgates off when the water is coming into the city and they can release the floodgates when they want to put water out of the city. They also have a series of locks as well for boats to go from higher levels to lower levels. And they, they want to position a sensor like at several areas just along one floodgate. Pretty interesting. I, I think it's very exciting. And here is our other project. This is the um, Savannah 
at the bottom of the mountains in the North Rupununi district in Guyana in Latin America. This is what it looks like during the dry season. And this is what it looks like during the rainy season. So they, um, it's mostly indigenous community villages that live out there. Um, they call themselves collectively Amerindians, um, but they have the same problem that we do on the coast, uh, driving into floodwater, same thing. And, you know, the floodwater rises and you need to, you know, get home before your road is closed off. Uh, so they are deploying their very first flood sensors out there. And again, they don't have wide cell networks. They don't have cell networks at all. Um, they are relying on, <laughs> I'll show you in a second. They're relying on LoRaWAN. Um, they do have Wi-Fi service at one building in uh, their village. And here it is. <laughs> so we packaged and sent them this, uh, this box here. This, um, this is the LoRaWAN gateway with an antenna. And they climbed up on the roof of their community uh, village and installed the gateway up there. And then they installed their first one experimental sensor uh, down on the lake. That lake has a 20 foot swing in levels, you know, depending on the season. Um, so we're going to see how it goes. If this is a good solution, uh, they can get international funding to actually deploy more of these things in their region and help their community to deal a little bit more with the rainy season. So friends, um, that is the fun that we're currently having with flood data. Um, we are looking forward, I think, you know, the. The more we advance, uh, the more sophisticated we get, the more sophisticated our customers get, and the more we can connect with uh, researchers and data analytics companies, um, the more we can uh, do cooler things with data. I think always with the end goal of how can we better serve communities? How can we better be more resilient to climate change and um, you know, protect especially the most marginalized people who seem to be most improportionally impacted by, uh, by frequent flooding. And I just wanted to know if you had ideas, if you had questions, if you had um, comments for me, is there somebody I should be talking to, um, potential customer, maybe potential collaborator, who else out there is really interested in fun with flood data? Thank you so much, Karen. Um, if anyone has any questions or suggestions, please feel free to unmute yourself. If you're more comfortable, please reach out to Karen directly. She's provided all of her information here. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, I'll leave the floor open for just a couple minutes. A couple questions coming in here, Karen. Oh, Marilla, thank you for your question. Um, we do not currently uh, work with satellite yet ourselves. Um, it is, it's a very interesting technology. It's currently quite expensive for our customers. Um, and uh, I would say that we use it indirectly in the sense that most of the federal sensors that are deployed by the United States Geological Survey, if you actually go to water.gov, uh, I think you will you know, find, you, anybody can access those sensors and that data. Uh, so yeah, in that sense, we, we use it and we would like to start incorporating some of those federal sensors into our dashboard. Um, I know that there are some projects out there to make satellite data a little bit cheaper. Um, I also think, and maybe this is too much answer for the question that you asked, that people will increasingly be looking for um, redundancy in communications and failover communications because, uh, you know, even in the case of satellite data, there was a couple of years ago, I think it was 2019, uh, one of the satellite communications was knocked out and one quarter of all of the flood sensors in the United States were, couldn't report for several days. Um, so no one system of communication is absolutely fail-proof. And I think you, for critical 
deployments, you will see customers looking more and more for dual communication modes. That was great, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful questions and thanks for answering them in line, Karen. Wonderful. Well, if there are no more questions, again, I encourage you to reach out to Karen directly. Um, when COVID um, subsides, I encourage you to also <laughs> visit Greenstream out at the Wireless Research Center. Um, they are also come down to Riot Labs in downtown Raleigh if you're local. If not, you can um, connect via LinkedIn. But thank you, everyone, for being here. Karen, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you to all. Always a pleasure. Please do reach out. Take care, everyone. Bye.